Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner. And my friend, I'm so glad that you've let us come right into your space. And the us is me and Denise, because Denise is joining us again today. Hey, sweetheart. Thank you, Rick. It's an honor to be on your program. And it's also a privilege to hear this teaching. Well, yesterday we talked about the Apostle Paul. While he was something else before he got saved, he was religious, but he was mean. And in fact, if you understand Paul's words that he writes himself about himself, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, he was rotten to the core. He was a mean individual. And in fact, he was so mean, Luke describes him with a word that describes a wild, diseased pig in Acts chapter 8, verse 3. That is amazing. That's how Luke describes him. But he was saved. And Paul tells us by his own testimony in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, that Christ Jesus apprehended him. That word apprehend, the Greek word katalambano, means Jesus just took him down, conquered him, mastered him. And the only thing he could do is say, Lord, he got saved. In Acts chapter 9, verse 5, when he called Jesus Lord, and Jesus apprehended him and enabled him to go into the ministry. And if God can do that with Saul of Tarsus, he can do it with anybody, including you and your kids and your grandkids and your friends. The meanest person you know can be apprehended by Jesus and transformed by his grace and become a powerful person. Wow. That's just one example among 10 in the brand new series called 10 Powerful Men. And in this series, we talk about Noah. That was a powerful man. We talk about Abraham, the mistake-making father of faith that became a powerful man. We talk about Samuel, who became a powerful prophet when he was a child. We talk about David, who was powerful as a teenager. We talk about Daniel, who was powerful into his elder years. We talked about Joseph, a man who proved himself faithful to God and became the foster father of Jesus. We talked about Peter, a businessman who became powerful in the kingdom of God. Then we looked at the life of the Apostle Paul. And today we're going to be looking at Timothy. And tomorrow we're going to wrap it up with the Apostle John. But please order your series today, 10 Powerful Men. And it comes with a study guide. You'll just love both of these together. And we're also offering you the book, which is called All the Men of the Bible. It's a resource that you will use again and again and again. So please order yours today. And we're also offering you, Denise, our brand new autobiography called Unlikely. Why do we call it unlikely? Rick, because it was so unlikely that we would be doing the things that we're doing, that God has called us to do these things. I mean, even this studio, we are in Moscow, Russia. Who would ever imagine the teaching of the Bible would go from Moscow, Russia to the ends of the earth? That's very unlikely. That's very unlikely. But God loves to do unlikely things, and that's why we called our autobiography Unlikely. And the subtitle says, Our Faithful Journey to the Ends of the Earth, Unlikely. And my friend, we want you to read it because it will encourage you to launch out by faith to start your own unlikely journey. God wants to do something remarkable in your life. And if you say, well, I'm just such an unlikely candidate, then you're the one he's looking for. That's why you need to read this book. It will really encourage you. And please remember that if you need prayer, we want to hear from you. In our ministry, we believe in prayer. We are people of prayer. And when we hear from you, we really begin to pray expressly for you and your need. And when you inform us about how to pray, it helps us pray better for you. So write to us or even give us a call right now. We're waiting to hear from you. And the moment we do, we're going to begin to pray expressly, explicitly for the need in your life, believing Jeremiah 33, 3, that if we call to God in faith, God will show you great and mighty things. But we'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Today, we're going to continue talking about 10 powerful men. 
And today we're focusing on Timothy, but reach for your Bible. We always use the Bible in this program and we're believing for a revival of the Bible in the body of Christ. But let's go back to our anchor verse, Denise, which is in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, which says, God's eyes are running to and fro in the earth, looking for one that he can show himself strong to. And one day, God's eyes fell on a teenager who lived in Derby, whose name was Timothy. And you can read about when the Apostle Paul first came to Derby in Acts chapter 14. First, he preached in Lystra. And the Bible tells us that in Lystra, they stoned him to death. And the believers gathered around him and prayed, and he was raised from the dead. And when he was raised from the dead, he just picked up where he left off and moved on to the next city. And the next city was Derby. And when he was in Derby, he preached the gospel with signs and wonders. And in the crowd was a Jewish woman that got saved. And she had a young boy whose name was Timothy. And he also got saved. Several years later, Paul came back to Derby. And we read about it in Acts chapter 16, verse 1, which says, Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold. By the way, the word behold in Greek means, wow, this is amazing. So even Luke is quite impressed with this story. He injects the word behold, the Greek word edu, which means, wow, this is remarkable. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. That's what the King James Version says, but it's the word Timothy. But because Luke injects the word behold, it means Luke was pretty impressed with this young Timothy. And the verse tells us the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish and believed, but his father was a Greek. So we think that Timothy was probably saved several years earlier when Paul first came to Derby after Paul had been raised from the dead and he came with signs and wonders. His mother got saved and Timothy got saved. And now several years have passed and now Paul has come back to Derby. And behold, wow, there was quite a remarkable young man there whose name was Timothy. His mother was a Jewish who believed, but his father was a Greek which means his mother got saved, but his father did not get saved. You know, sometimes kids grow up in houses where one parent is saved and another parent is not saved, and it's a very difficult situation. That was Timothy's situation. But when we read 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Paul, writing to Timothy, describes Timothy's family. And he says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. By the way, the word unfeigned means a faith that is unbendable, unbreakable. It's a real, real faith. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that it's in thee also. But notice Paul says, it dwelt first in your grandmother and your mother. That word dwelt means to take up residency. This wasn't just a faith that they mentally believed in. This was a living, breathing faith that dwelled in them, that thrived in them. And Paul was so familiar with the family that he knew the name of Timothy's grandmother. He said, it first dwelt in your grandmother Lois, so it seems she was the first to get saved, and your mother Eunice. So now we find the name of Timothy's mother, her name was Eunice, and he says, I'm persuaded that in thee also the same living, breathing faith which dwelt in your grandmother and your mother has been passed on to you. And here we find such an encouragement that we can pass our faith to the next generation. You can pass your faith to your kids. You can pass your faith to your grandchildren. Here we find faith passing from a grandmother to a daughter to a son. And then when you go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, we find out something else about Timothy's childhood. It says that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Denise, that word child is not the word for a teenager. It's the Greek word brephos, which describes a child that is still breastfeeding which means from the time that he was still nursing at his mother's breast, she was speaking the Holy Scriptures to him. Now, she was not saved yet. She was a Jew. But she was speaking the Old Testament Scriptures to that little baby who was breastfeeding. And the word Scriptures that is used here really is the word for a little jot or a little tittle or a little mark. 
which means from the age that Timothy was very, very young, his mother told him every mark, every jot in the scripture is holy. It is to be revered. It is to be respected. And of course, then later on, he got saved and he found faith in Christ Jesus. This is quite amazing. But going back to Acts chapter 16, verse 2, we find out more about Timothy. It says, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. When the Bible says well reported, it's a form of the Greek word marturomai, which means to have a good testimony. He had a good testimony. He had a good report of the brethren. And in Greek, it is the word hupo. The word hupo means under. In this particular case, it describes the brethren taking a scrutinizing view of him. They weren't just guessing that he was a nice young man. They had really observed him. They had kept their eyes on him. And they were able to give a good report from the Greek word, which means to give a testimony in a court of law. Just like somebody will say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, so help me God. They could say, we swear to tell the truth, the whole truth about Timothy, we're telling you you, this is a great young man. And the word hupo tells us they had really scrutinized him. They really knew what kind of a young man he was. And of course, he had come to faith in Christ. And they came to understand, even though he was very young, he was very devout and was very serious as a disciple. And in Acts chapter 16, verse 3, we find out something remarkable about this young man. Look at this. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And the Jews would not listen to him or receive him if he was not circumcised. All right. His daddy was a Greek. And because his daddy was a Greek, he did not require the baby Timothy to be circumcised. Well, at the time, that Timothy began to travel with Paul, it seems he was maybe 16 years old. He could not have been more than 20. Well, you know, Denise, it's one thing to circumcise a newborn baby. But when you're 16 to 20, it's a whole different matter to submit yourself to the knife and be circumcised. It says something about his willingness. He was so willing to do whatever he had to do to be used by God that when Paul said, hey, for us to reach Jews, you have to be circumcised. He said, I'll submit myself to the knife, do whatever you have to do. I want to be used by God. I want to travel with you. I want to serve in the ministry. It says something about Timothy's heart. How many young men do you think would have said, I'll submit to the knife? It says something about his heart and his spiritual desire. This was a young man that really wanted to be used by the Lord. That is amazing to me. He really desired to be used. But wait, when you go to Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 to 20, Paul gives us insight into the heart of Timothy. This is many, many, many years later. Timothy's been in the ministry for years. And listen to what Paul writes about Timothy in Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. When Paul says, I have, in Greek it is the word echo, which means to have, to hold, or to possess. Paul literally says, I have in my possession no man like-minded. And in Greek, the words no man, the Greek word udina, means emphatically, absolutely no one, not even one. He could only think of one that was like-minded to him, and that was Timothy. But what does the Bible mean when it says he was like-minded? Well, in Greek, it is the word isosukas. It's a compound of two words. The word isos denotes something that is equal or something that is identical equal or identical. The word sukas is from the word suke, which is where we get the word for psychology, and it's the Greek word for the soul. But when you compound the two words together, it depicts one that is identical in soul, one that is identical or equal in affection, emotion, and in every aspect of the feelings and convictions of one's soul. 
Or Paul says, well, this is really a unique individual. He's like me in my feelings, in my convictions. In fact, if you have Timothy, it's like you still have me because the two of us, Isos, we are identical. We're equal in so many respects. And of course, Timothy had traveled with Paul for years and he had derived so much from the Apostle Paul. And Paul knew that he could really trust Timothy. But he goes on and he says, who will naturally care for your state. Naturally care in Greek is a word that denotes the feelings a mother has for a newborn child. It means to genuinely, authentically care for someone like a mother caring for a newborn. And Paul now says, Timothy really loves you. This is not just a profession to him. He authentically cares for you. And he goes on to say, who will naturally care for your state. Well, Denise, in Greek, it says it a little bit different. The Greek says ta peri human, which means the things concerning you or the things surrounding you. Timothy had his mind on people. He did not have his mind on himself. And that's why Paul goes on in Philippians 2, 21 and says, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. And Paul learned the lesson like many of us have learned that most people are not thinking about other people. Most people are thinking about themselves. In fact, in this verse, it says, for all seek their own. The word seek, the Greek word zuteo means they're very intensely looking for something. But in this particular case, Paul says their own. In Greek, it says ta eon, which means the things of themselves, the things about themselves, where it literally means most people are intensively looking after the things about themselves, or they are obsessed with themselves, or they are self-focused and not the things which are Jesus Christ and the things which are Jesus Christ are people. They're not thinking about others. They're thinking about themselves. But in Philippians 2 verse 22, Paul then adds, but you know the proof of him that as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. And when Paul says, you know, the word know is the Greek word ginosko, which means to emphatically know. This was not a question everybody knew. They emphatically knew this one thing about Timothy. They emphatically knew the proof of him. Well, hold on. What does that mean? The word proof is the Greek word dokimadzo. Now listen to what it means. It describes a test to determine the quality or sincerity of a thing, which means his sincerity had been proven. It had been proven. The object being scrutinized has passed the test, so now it can be viewed as genuine and sincere. This very word, dokimazo, here translated proof, was used to illustrate the tests that were used to determine real and counterfeit coinage, a test to prove what was real and what was bona fide. It meant to approve and deem fit after appropriate testing and was the very word used to describe the testing process to determine if an individual's character was sufficient for him to be deemed fit for public office. Now, this is very, very important because it means through life and in ministry, Timothy has been in so many different situations that he has been tested. People have seen him go through multiple tests, multiple trials. He has passed every test. Now they know he is sincere. He is the real deal. Well, in New Testament times, especially during the time of Nero, Nero falsified a lot of coinage. He needed a lot of money and he didn't have that much money. So he made fake coins. He took bronze and covered them with a very thin layer of silver. So it looked like it was solid silver, but really it was counterfeit money. And the way you would determine what was real and what was counterfeit was you would put it in the fire and the fire would expose that the core was bronze and you would know you had something fake. That's the word that is used here, which means Timothy has been through enough events in life to reveal whether he was fake or whether he was the real deal. Probably his tests were working with Paul because Paul was a pretty tough individual. He was a tough character. And Paul says, hey, this young man has been through so many tests, through so many trials, probably working with him. 
that it has exposed. He is the real deal. I know I can trust him. This man is sincere. In fact, he goes on in verse 22 and says, as a son with the father. Look at the relationship that existed between the two of them. He has served with me in the gospel. And Denise, the word served is the Greek word dolos. The word dolos is the lowest, most abject term for a slave in the New Testament. It pictures one whose will is completely swallowed up in the will of another. And because it is used in this verse, in the context of him serving as a son with his father, it means Timothy had been swallowed up in doing whatever Paul needed him to do. He had really been a servant to the Apostle Paul. He had been through tests. He had been through trials. He had been through fire. And at the end of the day, Paul knew and everybody else knew this was a young man that had been proven. He was the real deal. And guess what? When a leader was needed to lead the church in Ephesus and bring correction to false teaching there, it was Timothy. Timothy was chosen because he had proven himself. He had proven himself. And when you read 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul writes that he left Timothy in Ephesus to set in order things that were out of order and to correct those that were teaching false doctrine. And Timothy, who entered into the ministry between age 16 and 20, ended up as the senior pastor of the church of Ephesus and served the church of Ephesus till his later years. At one moment, he was dealing with the spirit of fear. And Paul wrote to him in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, said, Timothy, Paul, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He so overcame that spirit of fear that early historians tell us that at the age of 80, this boy who proved himself faithful, a devout, serious disciple, even when he was a teenager, followed Paul, served Paul, ended up as the pastor of Ephesus, and in his 80s, he had so overcome a spirit of fear that when pagans were marching down the Curitas Street right in the center of Ephesus, he came out and commanded them to repent. This was not a man that had a spirit of fear. He commanded them to drop their idols and to repent, and they killed him. He was martyred, we believe, about the age of 80, but not with the spirit of fear. He was quite an amazing man. He was a powerful man that God used. And God wants to use you too. We'll be back in just a moment and we're going to pray for you. Men are supposed to be powerful, but today men everywhere feel like they're under attack and even being attacked for simply being men. There's no doubt about it. The devil is after men. But when a man's heart is touched by God, he can embrace his calling as a man and his God-given roles in the family and in the nation. In this amazing series, 10 Powerful Men, Rick Renner will show you that even though there's no such thing as a perfect man, if any man will let God touch his life, he can become powerful. In this series, you'll learn about a man who didn't communicate right with his wife, a mistake maker who became the father of faith, an emotional man Jesus chose to be a leader, a murdering man that Jesus turned into an apostle, and so much more. This encouraging 10-part series will help any man embrace who God has made him to be, and it will help every man, teenager or boy, know that God has anointed him to be the best man he can be. Available in digital or physical formats, this series is available starting at just $20. And today, we're offering the 384-page book, all the Men of the Bible by Herbert Lockyer for just $19. This invaluable book describes the monumental feats of men named in the Bible and thousands of unnamed men who also carried out monumental achievements in their lifetimes. Don't miss this special offer, the 10-part series, 10 Powerful Men, and the book, All the Men of the Bible by Herbert Lockyer. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Well, they will call and say, I just happened to come across this, this man and his demeanor and his, uh, he has such a peace about him. And I really like the fact that he is so versed in the Word of God, so versed in uh, what he's teaching on. You can tell he really puts the time into it. But he's also easy to listen to because, um, I, you know, Pastor Rick is operating in his gift. 
and within that gift there is um, a certain circle of people that may not always follow certain teachings, whether it be on healing or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Maybe that wasn't their background, but the way Pastor Rick's demeanor is, and because of his um, study of the Word, they take the time to listen. I've prayed with a lot of people that have been saved their whole life, been in church their whole life, and said, he makes me trust that if I call you and ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that I'm getting something that's scriptural. And so that, that just blesses me. And then we talk to a lot of people from other countries. I, I mean, we talk to people all over the world. Some people call in and think that we're in Russia. And we're like, no, this is his stateside office. He does have a, an office in Russia. But we talk to people, I mean, I just talked to someone this morning from Norway. We talked to people from Canada. We talked to people from India. So it's not just within the United States. We're talking to people all over the world. And we're reaching the whole world from right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's exciting. It was a great connection for them. So many people are isolated, have been isolated, and they were fearful, and they found a place where they could be encouraged, taught, strengthened, prayed for, and people who loved on them and cared for them. My friend, we are growing as a ministry. People are responding to the teaching of the Bible. They're reaching out to us for resources, for prayer, and for ministry. And God has given us the awesome responsibility of ministering to them, and we need more space to do it. So would you please pray about becoming a part of the giving team to help with our ministry expansion project. Thank you so much for being with me and Denise today. Denise, we have had quite a time in the Bible today. Oh, this was amazing. I can hardly wait for tomorrow because tomorrow we're going to wrap it up looking at the Apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who received the book of Revelation on the Isle of Patmos. What an amazing testimony. He was a man that God used. But Denise, we're looking at 10 men that God used. They were powerful men. And I want you to have the whole series called 10 Powerful Men, which you can order at our website right now by going online, or you can even give us a call. And by the way, be sure that you get the study guide that goes with it. The study guide is wonderful. And right now we're also offering you the book, which is called All the Men of the Bible. It's more than 3,000 Bible names. Please order yours today. And remember that when you become a partner with our ministry, the moment you join our partner family, we're going to send you Denise's book called The Gift of Forgiveness and my book called Life in the Combat Zone, which is dedicated to to partners. And if you have a prayer need, give us a call or send us an email. We will begin to pray for you immediately. But we're going to pray for you right now. Father, Denise and I thank you for the privilege that today we could bring the living Word of God to our friend. Father, we thank you that you're looking for someone to use and you want to use every one of us. So Lord, we avail ourselves to you for you to show yourself strong to us and to work strong through us. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you tomorrow. But remember, Ecclesiastes 8.4, it says where the word of a king is, there's power. Thank you for watching this broadcast. For more information on product resources or to learn how you can partner with this ministry, please connect with us at renner.org. Also, please be sure to visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.